It's a pleasure to be here and to be part of this conversation about Hamilton. Today, I'm going to talk about healthy and safe communities. What are the factors that underlie them? And talk a bit about Hamilton's drug strategy. And so there's a lot we're going to talk about in a bit about our connected wor world over the internet and technology. But right now, I'm going to talk about our connected world between the people of this community and the policies that support it. So public health, I have to take a moment to talk about what is public health. And in many ways, what Dr. Warner just, just described has a lot to do with it. But my, uh, my mother was an OR nurse. She was an, a nurse anesthetist in England, a midwife. She was a research administrator. And she never quite understood what I did. She never quite understood what public health was. And what public health is, is really not just what we in particular health units or uh, particular staff do, but it is what all of us as society work together to promote, improve, and when necessary, restore the health of individuals, groups, and the entire population. It is a combination of sciences and skills and values that function through collective societal action and inv the involved programs, societies, and institutions aimed at protecting and improving the health of all people. And in fact, when public health works best is, as Dr. Warner just described, when things don't happen, when the bad stuff doesn't happen, and so it makes it a little bit difficult to measure our impact at times. Community safety is about feeling safe here, and I think Beatrice did a great job of talking about safety on our streets, and what it means is that we feel safe in our homes, on our streets, in our work, that we can live our lives without fear. A common thought is that community safety is delivered by the police and that health is something you get at a doctor's office. There is a direct connection between safety and health and we often treat them as separate issues with separate budgets, separate departments, separate programs. And in any case, with the greatest respect to my colleagues from the police department that are here and to my healthcare partners that are out there, those are only a part of what makes our communities healthy and safe. The complex risks that are out there, the complex issues, cannot be addressed in isolation by any one organization, by any department, by any person. It needs all of our collective action. So our health is shaped by a number of interconnected and dynamic factors often referred to as the determinants of health. At every stage of life, our health is determined by the interactions between our social and economic factors, our physical environment, and our individual behavior. So when you look at the top of that slide, about 50% of what determines our health is what happens in our lives. It is early childhood development, it's education, it is about income and our work, it is about race, it's about gender, it is about social exclusion and the connection between us in a community. About 25% of our health is determined by the healthcare system, by access to that healthcare, by the quality of that care, and by how long it takes us to get access to it. 15% is determined by our biology, our genetic makeup, our bodies, those things. And about 10% by our environment, our air quality, our safe water, and our food we eat. So you can see by far, it is those social determinants of health that are the greatest factors. Healthcare remains on the top of the list of things that Canadians care about, but it isn't actually the biggest factor in determining our health. It is these social determinants, income, education, our work, our housing that make the greatest difference in terms of health outcomes and life quality. And the other thing is that addressing these determinants of health, everybody can do better on them, not just those who are in the poorest of health or those who have least access. And the other thing is that by improving access for everybody, improving equality of access, we make actually everyone in the community healthier. So, if we don't all have access, if we're not all healthy together, then none of us are as healthy as we could be. So what do those determinants of health look like here in Hamilton? I hope you can see some of the numbers that are up there, but I'll go through them for you. So I'll just ask you to, we're about 537,000 people here in Hamilton, but I'm gonna ask you to imagine for a moment that we're a village of 100 people. So if we looked at the age of these villagers, about 22 of them would be children and teens between 0 and 19. 26 would be 30 to 20 to 39. The largest group would be the villagers that are between 40 and 64. And about 17 would be 65 and over. If we look at education, 18 villagers would have less than a high school education. 23 would have achieved their high school certificate. 43 would have gone on to post-secondary education. And then turning back to those youngest schoolgoers, 
those children under age five, about one in three children when they get to school are vulnerable in one or more areas of school readiness. So a third of our kids arrive at school not ready to learn in one way or another. These villagers live in 39 households. 11 of those households are occupied just by a single person. Six of them are food insecure. Two of them actually have high levels of radon gas. And it takes a minimum of $187 each week to feed every household that has a family of four. What's our life expectancy like? Well, our life expectancy for Hamiltonians is about 80.5 years, which is continued to rise. And I'm sorry for the men in the crowd, but women continue to outlive men by about five years. 64 villagers report that they have very good or excellent mental health. 36 of those villagers have used illicit drugs in their lifetime. 54 have a strong sense of community well-being. Remember I talked about those 11 households that are occupied by a single person? 49 of them are overweight or obese. And 53 eat less than the recommended minimum of five servings of fruits and vegetables each day. And let me tell you, that's the recommended minimum. That's like the bottom floor. We'd really like that up more around seven, eight. 18 of the villagers are smokers, which is a vast improvement from uh, the 1970s when that would have been more like 41, 42% of the villagers are smoking, but we still got some room to go. And we can see the diverse immigrant backgrounds and, and income backgrounds. 75 of those villagers are born in Canada, 25 were born abroad. 16 villagers live in low-income households, and two of them live in households that after tax have more than $100,000 per year. If we look at the causes of death and disability in our uh, community, you can see that heart disease, lung cancer, dementia, Alzheimer's stroke, chronic respiratory disease, those are the top five. And if you look back at the factors that underpin those, you can see that tobacco that I talked about just a minute ago underpins a lot of it. And so the things that we did in the past that continue to influence us in our health as we age and uh, result in disease and disability. Now if I look at it over on that right side of the slide and break it down by age and sex, you see a different picture. So the leading cause of death for teens and young adults is intentional self-harm among young women and accidental poisoning amongst young men. So when I say intentional self-harm, it's a bit of a euphemism. I am talking about um, attempted or completed suicides. When I say accidental poisoning, I'm talking about unintended substance uh, use overdoses, usually through prescription or illicit drugs, and that may be because of recreational use or, or improper use of medication. If I look at middle-aged men and women, breast cancer emerges as the leading cause of death for middle-aged women, and intentional self-harm for middle-aged men. So if we look at our services, and I'm pleased to see my colleagues, Mike Sanderson, the chief of paramedics is here. I think it's saw Dave Cunliffe and others from FIRE, and of course we have our police colleagues here. Dan Kinsella is going to be with us, the deputy chief in the, on the panel. Too often, we need our emergency responders, our police, our paramedics, our hospital emergency departments, and other crisis-driven services to respond to situations that are rooted in poor mental health, in addictions, a lack of safe and affordable housing, and inadequate access to services or to simple social isolation. In many cases, these issues could be prevented or addressed earlier and more effectively by greater collaboration and streamlining among sectors and a focus on acting upstream. To more, to more effectively address some of the needs in our city, we need to think upstream. Upstream thinking means investing wisely in our future success rather than spending all of our time working downstream. We can see the consequences of downstream thinking all around us in places like eMERGE rooms, homeless shelters, the prison system, and those sorts of things. I'm going to just ask if we can play this video. It's a quick one minute, and it's probably the best example of what thinking upstream means that I've seen. You're standing on the edge of a river. All of a sudden, a flailing, drowning child comes floating by. Without thinking, you dive in, grab the child, and swim to shore. Before you can recover, another child comes floating by. So you dive in and rescue her as well. Then another child drifts into sight. And another, and another. Eventually, hopefully, some wise person will ask, who keeps chucking these kids in the river? And they'll head upstream to find out. Every time we have to clean up an environmental disaster, every time a young person winds up in jail, 
Every time, people have to take medications to make up for the fact that they couldn't afford good food. We're suffering from the results of downstream thinking. Thinking upstream means making smarter decisions about what kind of country we want. What better goal could Canada have than creating the conditions for all people to enjoy true health and experience physical, mental, and social well-being? It's the best way to measure our success. And upstream thinking is the way we get there. Help us make the mainstream look upstream. Visit us at thinkupstream.net to find out more. So if safety and health are our goals, then we need to tackle the root causes of the issues to have the greatest effect. I'm going to talk a little bit about health in all policies. So policy decisions affect our health. And it's not limited to policies in the traditional sector. I think you can see that when we talked about the determinants health, housing, all of the sorts of things we talked about, the stuff that Beatrice presented on this morning. And in fact, the policies from those other sectors have been shown to have a much more profound effect on our health. There are a variety of factors that we consider when we, de we develop policies. And the challenge is to recognize what the effects are on the things that make us healthy, how they affect different groups, when they affect people during their life course, and how they affect some people more than others. And in order to build healthy public policy, we have to understand the effects of those policies, the intended effects and the unintended effects. And often we find downstream effects of well-intentioned policies in unexpected places. And even policies with relatively clear outcomes that are positive can have downstream effects that may be either further positive effects or negative effects. So I want to turn to talk about a particular area around opioid-related deaths in uh, 2017 and the opioid crisis. And let's explore the policies around opioids. The opioid epidemic has made us all reflect on what we can do better to reduce the individual and community costs associated with drug use and overdose. The misuse of opioids like fentanyl is a growing public health concern and indicators of opioid use and opioid related emergency department visits and hospitalizations are on the rise. If you look here, these are the rates of death here in Hamilton in the blue line on the top compared to the province or the gold line on the bottom. Between 2005 and 2017, Hamilton had a higher rate of opioid-related deaths when compared to the provincial average. And that has continued to widen the, in terms of the gap, and of course you can see that huge gap in the last year. In 2017, Hamilton's opioid-related death rate was 72% higher than the provincial rate. In 2017, over 80 people died in Hamilton because of opioid overdose. It would have been even higher, however, if it weren't for a drug called naloxone. Naloxone is a medication that reverses the effects of opioid overdose. And in 2017, over 1,700 naloxone kits were distributed by public health, reviving 460 people. So far in 2018, there have been 4,400 naloxone doses distrib distributed by public health and naloxone, naloxone expansion sites in the city, reviving 432 lives. So that's on top of the lives that have been saved by our paramedics, our emergency departments, and others. In terms of those ED visits, those eMERGE department visits, you can see that the, the numbers are high and continue to rise. Between 2012 and 2017, we had a 183% increase in emergency department visits due to opioids. And when you take all substances together, just in the month of October this, this year, just last month, there were over 50 visits for poisonings due to substances in that month alone. In 2017, about 437 people called 911 for a suspected opioid overdose, which was about 36 per month. And that number is up because of the Good Samaritan laws that have been put in place that guarantee that if you call 911 and ask for help, that you won't get charged in terms of possession. This is just a little plug for the Hamilton Opioid Information System that we have on the wall. Please, paramedics, ourselves, emergency departments, emerge departments, hospitals, the coroner's office, contributes data together. We have a partnership that puts data there that you could look to in terms of the impact of the opioid crisis in our own community. So how does this relate to healthy public policy? Public policy has been a part of what has shaped this epidemic. It's not the only thing. There are plenty of roots of opioid misuse in the social determinants of health. But for now, I'm just going to focus on the policy aspects. Policies that have tried to keep us healthy and safe, and yet have had unintended consequences. 
And so the epidemic has shifted to look at those policies and say, are they, have they been effective in curbing drug use? Or have they actually led to additional harms? There's something called the prohibition paradox. Back in the early 1920s, there was an average of about 1,000 people lost a year in North America due to alcohol poisoning. This was because of prohibition. So this policy that led to illicit production of alcohol, it forced production into the underground markets without regulation or governmental oversight. And as a result, the liquor that was produced was often con contaminated of uncertain potency and caused blindness, hallucinations, and death. So somehow, we didn't learn from that policy experiment. And so we've ended up back in a similar place today. We have to look at our policies, assess them, and think about, we did our best thinking at the time, we did it with great intentions, but they've had unsustainable effects. So the current policy approach focuses on strict regulation through medical access, and through criminalization and prohibition. When we look at the medical aspects, just to start, we've had tightly controlled regulation and prescription access, but unfortunately, we've also had an over-reliance on opioids for pain management. We've had assurances that the drugs were safe and wouldn't be addictive, but it turns out they're not quite what we thought they would be. So opioids have been prescribed and used at a higher level than, what's, than really was good for our health. And the other thing is our expectations about a pain-free life are a little out of line as well. It's part of the challenge. That wasn't realistic. We do need good pain management, and that includes the use of opioids. But there are also other therapies to help us cope and, where necessary, live with chronic pain. And so those other therapies, mindfulness, yoga, physical therapy, those sorts of things. There's other therapies that we need to turn to as well, not just drugs. And then with policies, and we saw this more so perhaps in the United States, well-intentioned policies to curb prescribing. What happened in some places was it brought about instead fear amongst prescribers, and they stopped those drugs. And so they left people who were now dependent on those drugs, whose bodies craved them, to turn to somewhere else for their drug supply. And so they turned to the streets to the illicit supply of drugs, to relieve their cravings. So then we have the whole issue of criminalization. So criminalization of drugs has meant managing possession, production, import, export, trafficking through criminal law. It was there for the best of intentions to reduce harms, but its strategies have focused on punishment as deterrence, and unfortunately, although the intent to rehabilitate is there, it hasn't always met that goal. And so in practice, Criminalization has not had the intended effect in terms of curbing drugs, drug use, and it has had some unintended harms. It's been costly to individuals, families, and communities. It's increased stigma and doesn't address the harms disproportionately experienced by those who are vulnerable, such as people who are homeless or living in poverty, people with mental health and substance use issues, people from racialized groups, indigenous peoples, and women and youth. The stigma drives those who need relief from pain to depending on opioids from the street. It's led to more marginalization, it's contributed to the spread of HIV and hepatitis, and contributed to gangs and violence. In short, it is very unintentionally contributed to harming both healthy and safe for those who are dependent, became dependent on the drugs, those who are seeking them to manage their pain, and for all of us. So if we had this slide here, you would see that there's a U-shaped curve. And in essence, when we use strict prohibition, we end up suffering the harms of that more so than we intended. And at the other end of the curve, you would see that when we really commercialize and promote the use of substances, we again see the harms. With alcohol today, we don't have to worry that the alcohol that we buy is going to be contaminated or we won't know what proof it is or what it may be, we can be guaranteed that its quality is okay. We may be moving a little too far on that other end of the curve in terms of commercialization and access and those things. And I'll tell you today that alcohol continues to be the major substance in terms of its harms that it has on the health of our community. But I'm going to leave alcohol for another day and come back to opioids. So what we're looking for is to find that sweet spot 
that tension, the healthy tension between the criminalization and reducing access and the over commercialization and marketing of it. To find that spot where we can regulate supply, where we can manage it, manage access, make sure that people are not uh, able to access it, it's not marketed excessively, and that we don't also suffer the harms from being overly prohibited. Many jurisdictions are now looking at an approach based in public health and human rights, studying decriminalization as part of a comprehensive approach to drugs, looking at evidence and where, whether different decriminalization approaches would be an effective strategy to promote individual and community health to find that sweet spot where we can control the quality, control the plot supply, control the access, but also where we can talk about the realities of it, we can talk about its use, we can make decisions based on good information that comes through research that can be done on those substances, where we can talk with our youth about it and convince them about the health and safe impact, safe, the impacts it has on our health and safety, and dialogue and not create stigma and marginalization. So here in Hamilton, we have a group that has come together, a group of leaders from all sorts of different agencies and institutions, a group of community members, a group of people with lived experience who have come together under the umbrella of Hamilton drugs, Hamilton's drug strategy. It is an example of the collective approach to create social change and accomplish population-wide impacts. It's there to address the harms that are associated with substance use that are experienced by families, individuals, and the community. Its goal is that all Hamiltonians are free of harm due to substance use and are able to enjoy the best quality of life. Our partners include those from acute and primary care, from education, our school boards. It in includes uh, people who work in addictions and harm reduction, it includes corrections and justice and law enforcement. It includes community and social services, and perhaps most importantly, it includes the individuals with lived experience who have, and their families who can best help us understand the, the true experience of our system and living with substance use. It builds on the good work that is there, the foundation of our mental health and addiction partners, and works to, to look at where the gaps are and where we can move forward further. It is based on a four-pillar approach. The four pillar approach, and I think there's been a number of instances of four pillars this morning, so you've got a few pillars to think about, and of course all of these pillars are essential ones for our community. But this one imports the, or highlights the importance of accessible, affordable, and safe housing, as well as these things. So this approach started back in the 1990s in Europe, and has been based around prevention, so preventing problematic drug and substance use. It's based in treatment and supporting innovative approaches to treatment and rehabilitation. It's based in harm reduction. And harm reduction means knowing that people will use substances and how can we reduce the harms associated with them. For some who use them problematically, how can we work alongside them to reduce the harms like the spread of HIV and hepatitis and those sorts of things while they look at whether they can turn to some sort of treatment program. And finally, in enforcement. And here in Hamilton, we call this pillar the social justice uh, pillar, and looking at how do we address issues like production, supply, and other issues. So these have been tried in other jurisdictions like Frankfurt, Geneva, Sydney, and have seen a dramatic reduction in drug users, a drop in overdose deaths, and a reduction in infection rates, like in HIV and hepatitis. So together, we're working together to respond to community safety and health needs through a wide range of initiatives under these pillars. We have over 100 different agencies involved at present. If there is an interest in working on these things, please feel free to reach out to myself afterwards, to Brenda Marshall, who is the, uh, the staff person who supports this initiative, and we can connect you with any of these as we go forward. We'll be bringing forward the drug strategy to Council. It's uh, being finalized, and we'll be bringing it forward soon. Uh, it's out for community consultation. That may just be wrapping up right now, but we'll be talking about the specific actions and where we're going from here. So drug policy is one very relevant area of policy that we need to consider in terms of making our lives healthier. And when we're considering them and moving forward, we need to listen to the plurality of voices and perspectives on any issue, as well as what history and the emerging and evolving scientific evidence teach us along the way. We do need to be innovative and bold, and we need to be afraid, not afraid to fail. In fact, we need to fail and fail quickly, 
and look at it and examine the policies, examine what we're doing, and see what we need to do to correct it. And we need to monitor and evaluate as we go forward and look for best possible solutions. So as I wrap up here, I'd like to just end by encouraging you to think about what we can do collectively to better plan, coordinate, and streamline community-based initiatives to address the health, safety, and well-being of Hamiltonians. How we can put in place solid foundations based in the determinants for our kids as they grow. And how we can work upstream to keep people healthier and have healthy public policy that supports all of us. A special thank you out to Tara Johnston, who's just sitting here, who's our member on the planning committee and helped put all this, these slides together, and uh, for all your support through this. Uh, thank you very much, Tara.